because here we go. One second, yes. This is so exciting. I want to run my fingers through your hair. Uh, you know, I would so enjoy that. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> I'm one of those people that loves my curls. Ah, you got cute curls. Thanks. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I felt it. <laughs> Here is live video. I'm going to say, I'm going to title it Mid Life. Dating with you, with Jonathan, oops. Take over, all right, we are on our way. We are going live. And almost there. It says it's live on Facebook. Yeah, okay. We are now. Cool. And I'm going to pin you. Hello, hello, Jonathan. Welcome, welcome to this <laughs> episode of Chatting with Patty. Let me give you the proper introduction here. Uh, hi, everyone. I want you to really stay tuned and listen up closely to this man, uh, Jonathan Astley. He is a midlife dating coach. And why he's so special is, first of all, he wrote a book. He's the author of What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? I have the book. I began reading parts of it. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I'm going to pin you. Show that, show that again, Jonathan. There it is. <laughs> yes. And uh, Jonathan is extremely active on social media. He has YouTube, Facebook, Instagram always giving incredible, good, short tidbits of information. It's like you're in my head with all the questions I have. You seem to show up on YouTube with, and have you thought about this? And there you are. So thank you for joining us. I really appreciate this. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. So cool. what do you want to talk about, sweetheart? I want to talk about a few things. But first of all, I want to touch base because you've been a dating coach for a long time. I, I don't know, how many years now is this? Over a decade. Wow. Okay, cool. And I'm going to go right into this part because in 2018, you went through a devastating loss. Uh, it was the loss of your son, Connor. Mm -hmm. And you were very transparent through this ordeal that you were going through and, and dealing with the grief and coping with it. And I noticed in your journey and in this, this transparency that you were going through and sharing with all of us live, really, you, you had a sort of um, epiphany, if I can say, you really changed the way you approach dating and, and being a dating coach specifically and dealing with love. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and what that was like for you and what happened during that time and how it changed? For sure. You? So, um, well, there's, this is a multifaceted question because um, losing my son, Connor, I, I recognize that anyone who's a parent knows that their greatest fear is something happening to their child. I mean, you know, whether it's death or they do some criminal act or something, it's, I mean, and, you know, or whatever, they're suffering from alcoholism or drugs or whatever is, you know, as a parent, there's such a pull to want to be protective of our children. And, and I spent 20, you know, between both my children, 20 plus years in worry, is something going to happen? Something's going to happen. And bam, now it happened. So I had a, I felt like I had a choice. I could grieve with suffering or I could grieve with love. And I chose love as my way of grieving. In other words, leaning into what does it really mean to love both yourself, to love those around you, to love humanity. And I was inspired hugely to write, you know, what two months after he passed, I was like this call you got to write this. I, I'd been blogging about self-love. Let me rewind for a second. I'd been blogging about self-love for quite a while, but it was like I was being called. You've got to write a book about self-love. And, and self-love 
some people think that's woo woo. Some people think that's, you know, um, maybe spiritual. What it really means is it's connecting with your self-worth, your self-confidence, your self-esteem, and to connect with humanity from those places. So the book was literally wrote itself in six months and it was published nine months after the day. Part of the reason why there was a profound change is that I w- I'm going to be honest. I kind of had a chip on my shoulder when it came to women. So really? here I'm a dating coach, but some of that was actually coming because I had such a chip on my shoulder because I went through a contentious divorce and I had so many women who have ghosted me, who have been flaky, who have been blah, 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 blah. All the different you know, things that women complain about in men. I was experiencing the same thing in women. And so my, my original coaching was birthed out of like, I got tired of feeling, I know so many men that got tired of feeling this way. So I coach women on helping them understand men this way. But there was, I recognized that there was a chip on my shoulder. And when Connor passed, that chip was gone. Because it was more about how am I going to love on myself through this painful ordeal? And how can I spread love and joy to others at the same time? So I share this with you. I don't make that, I haven't made that really public, this chip on my shoulder, but I recognized it was there because of all the pain that I'd experienced. And and I'm not alone in so many men feeling this way, just like women aren't alone in feeling. And by the way, I did a video recently why women need to call men out on their shit. It's by the way, can I curse? Yes, you can. Okay. So it's fucking bullshit, some of the male behavior out there, completely unconscious and completely myopic to their own point of view and not recognizing that there's another person sitting across the table here on this date. And it's not about your needs being met. It's about a we thing. So I'm a big advocate now for conscious dating. I'm an advocate for um, intentional dating. I'm an advocate for a more open, compassionate, positive way to approach the process. And I'm going to call shit out the way I see it. You know, it's, uh, thank you for sharing that. And it's interesting you say that because at the beginning of your book, as I was reading through it, I uh, saw myself as that recovering nice person. Uh, okay. to, to your point about calling men out on their, on their shit or ourselves on, on, on our shit. Yeah. And I usually am pretty good with, with owning what's going on within me, but I have, I've had, and I'm learning to come from a place of love to, sh- to not always share what's going on because I don't want to come across as someone who's not nice or however that may be. And I don't know if this is a typical thing with a lot of women, but uh, can you speak to all of that? This thing about being, sure. nice? you know, I did a, I did a video, uh, on my YouTube channel called Stop Being Nice with Men and Here's Why. Now, someone once told me nice is not telling people how you really feel, okay? So now that's different than being, you know, courteous and and conscientious and polite and, and that sort of thing. But nice sometimes is really a holding back on how you feel. So chapter one in my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? Go to Amazon.com, buy it right now. Um, Little little pitch. Um, Is chapter one, speak your truth, do it with kindness. Our truth are our feelings. And so being nice, not always, but sometimes is actually is, 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 is doing this to your truth. And I'm a big proponent of speaking up. And so there's another chapter in my book that says, if it's sincere and from the heart, you can't say the wrong thing to the right person. So I'm a big advocate of speaking up. Now, I say tongue in cheek, call men out on their shit, just like I think women need to be called out on the shit. This is equal on both sides of the gender aisle, okay? Now, calling out really more is like, look, this is what I'm feeling, I'm feeling not appreciated in this relationship. And I just want you to know that. And is this something you're willing to work on? You're, you're making a request, you're making a bid for, a, for closeness in the relationship. Now, I, you know, but it's also making that request, call it out, don't mm-hmm. stuff it in. Because when we stuff things in, all it does is darken our own hearts. So 
to that point, um, what I, you also talk about, and I think this is part of calling it out, I, I think, okay, because yeah. you talk about trusting, you know, trusting your intuition and what, and uh, what I'm going to share with you is often be uh, dating. Yeah. I actually think, and, and, oh gosh, I have two thoughts here. One is I think dating really makes us aware on how much we truly do love ourselves because this is where things I've noticed for myself. <laughs> Yeah. I have a contrary point of view. So okay, so tell going. me, but I'll share what happens with me. I notice that my what I think I own is only sort of pushed when I'm in dating situations. So this oh, yes, is where, yes, yes. Yeah, so this is what I mean by the self love, where I have to speak up or call something out because I notice by myself it's sort of easy to be to say I love myself to some degree, but when I'm with someone, I notice things that uh, I may be ignoring or not talking about and all this, because it only happens when I'm in a relationship or dating. So this is what I mean by sometimes how, how I truly love myself. Uh, the light shines on me more when I'm in on a, when I'm dating or in a relationship. Well, so, so interesting enough and in, in everyone, my podcast, I have a podcast called the what would love do podcast where we explore life, love and the pursuit of inner peace. I start the podcast every episode saying, are you aware of the number one emotional health issue facing almost everybody? And I mean, everybody, but I'm going to be nice and say almost everybody. And at the core, we all suffer on a wound of, I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm not likable. And nothing triggers that more than dating and relationships. It is like, it is like being in the tornado, the earthquake, the hurricane of stirring our shit up. And it's a great laboratory to also heal oneself at the same time. Because we need the mirroring, this, this contentiousness, to really look inside. Now, most people deflect and they claim victim consciousness. Here in the United States, people are sucking on the nipple of victimhood like nobody's fucking business. I mean, it's just rampant, especially now with the political climate. Every, everybody's a fucking victim. And true emotional maturity is taking ownership in your experience, you take personal responsibility for your choices, okay? Now, I'm not suggesting that people haven't been victimized. I am remotely not even close to saying that. I'm saying a consciousness of victimhood and no true ownership. So, as to your point, Patty, yes, dating and relationships can trigger and they can be a great laboratory for healing oneself on the inside, okay? Most people you know, when given that opportunity, you know, it's like the Mr. Phelps, are you willing to accept this assignment from Mission Impossible? Most people don't. They bury their head in the sand and they point fingers at someone else, hence the victim consciousness. So I try to be a wake up call and I scream and I yell on my videos and I curse at my videos. That passion that I have is to, I wanna shake the screen and get people to shift. Now, I could do it the fun, I could do it the light, airy, fairy way, but that's not my style. So I scream and yell, just like a parent does. Yes. And, <laughs> and I consider oh, myself oh, incredibly parental, but it's coming from a place of care. Yes, yes. And, I, 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 I so uh, sense that from you and honor that because that is, you know, tough love. It is. Love isn't, doesn't always well, come I, pretty bow I, and sweet. Yeah, I call my coaching heart-centered radical honesty. It's direct, a little tough love, a lot of heart. I end every video with a big gigantic Jonathan Bear hug. You know that about me. Yes. And my point is we all need more hugs. We need more compassion. We need compassion for ourselves and for others. And you pointed something out, Patty. Here's the challenge with a lot of people. They don't see their own blind spots. Okay. Even I, the other day I called uh, a dear therapist friend of mine because I was struggling with something and I go, can I just talk it out with you? Because I don't see my blind spot here. She like literally in 30 seconds saw it, but I couldn't see it. But I also took ownership of it. Mm -hmm. Some people when they're called, their blind spot is called to them, they deflect because they're afraid to accept that there's work that needs to be done. 
Hence why I say it's a daily practice of personal development, self-help, and spiritual work, if you want to experience inner peace. Uh, amen. All right. So let's talk about uh, something that you touched on about you being this uh, coaching in modern day and, and, and what that looks like. Because I've had a few women who've messaged me who say that they've sort of, I'll say, resigned to not dating because it's because of all of everything that they go through with a lot of people that are, are not conscious and, and, and the frustrations that comes with all of online dating. Cause that is, yeah. let's face it. It's how most people meet today. Yeah. And, and I know it's a big question, but you know, how, how can you, what can you tell women to make them feel that the going through all this is worth it? Like, um, you, you know, so, okay. I want to respond to that because the reality is it's a cluster fuck out there. It is stop. You know, all these coaches that make it seem like, Oh, it's just, you're going to naturally meet someone online and it's going to be so beautiful and wonderful. Yeah, it does happen. And interesting enough, 50% of all new relationships happen with an online connection, but it's a mess because people are dysfunctional. You know, most people, I, 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 listen, no disrespect. I say most people are fucked up, it's just a matter of degrees. They are either Gandhi or Mother Teresa on one end of the spectrum, or they're Jeffrey Dahmer and Lizzie Borden on the other end of the spectrum. Most everybody's in between. So yes, dating is a mess, but here's the thing, and I, this may give you hope, it may not. To me, love is a risk but it's also the best game in town. So you can either be a defeatist, you can be Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, dating sucks, there's no good men out there, there's no good women, women are you know, you know, um, um, gold diggers, men are assholes, men are jerks, men are players, men are cheaters and liars. You could be Eeyore or you could be Tigger. You get the choice. Tigger is bouncity, bouncity, bounce, bounce, bounce. And I'm gonna tell you, Tigger has a better time than Eeyore. So your perspective is what matters. Accept the fact that it's a mess. Now find a way around it. And that starts with here and especially in here. Because when you love on yourself, the clusterfuck ain't gonna matter because you already feel good about yourself. In fact, when I'm here, look, I use this little device, you know, and I swipe left or I swipe right. You know what I do when I swipe the other way, I'm not interested. I always say, I love you to everybody. I just say, I love you. I love you. I you know, in other words, not I'm in love with you, but I send love. I send you love. You know, you're not a fit for me. That's one way to shift energy to Tigger. Then, oh my God, there's a guy holding a fish. What a lame dude. Well, he's holding, he's standing in front of a car, you know, a sports car with the shirt. What a player. You know, you can have a negative perspective or you can just send the person some love. I did, when Connor passed away, I'm doing his eulogy. And I stopped in the middle, I said, I'm gonna grieve with love. That means I'm also stepping into loving in every opportunity I can. So when I watched the debates last night, and that was a clusterfuck of clusterfucks, okay? I just send love to both candidates, to both candidates. I love, send love to their family. I send love to humanity. It's just sending love. Now, you have a choice. Some people think that's woo-woo, that's ridiculous, ain't gonna count for anything. But I feel like I have greater inner peace over it. I, I don't know, I'm, I can only speak for myself and that's my invitation for people to answer your question. Well, that, yes, uh, I, great. Uh, you, you did call it out as it is. It is, um, you know, as someone who's myself, who's been dating for many years, uh, I have to say that uh, each date has gotten me to that place of, of, uh, of practicing everything I want to be done onto me. And, and you can share about that. Like if I want someone to be able to create safe space for me to share, if I want to be able to talk, you know, share my, you know, um, share my boundaries, I have to be able to give the same thing back to the other person. So I, I started to recognize yeah. if I want someone to be able to create the safe space for me to share, I have to give that to the man. So I, I used to have come practice the conversation of giving him the possibility to share what's going on inside of him, even if it's going to be imperfect. 
And it's all right because the process of sharing can shed some light for yourself sure. and for me. So, um, so to and by your- the way, I always say women are the, okay, so there's this expectation that men are the leaders of the relationship, right? We're the ones that take you out. We wine and dine you because we're trying to get laid. Okay, let's get real, okay? We don't know you from Adam. You know, when a guy meets you on a first date and he goes, oh my God, you're the most amazing woman I ever met. Oh my God, you're so wonderful. I want to get married with you. I want to take you on trips. That's such a crock of shit. He's just amped up on the chemicals of, of, of testosterone, of oxytocin, of dopamine. That's all that's going on on a first date. I mean, it's rare that you genuinely meet that pure soulmate that you genuinely are you know, and, and I mean, it's, I'm not saying people don't eventually meet their soulmates, but it's not like it's, you just know on the first meeting. So all that rhetoric that guys say is not real until you actually get to know someone. I forgot my train of thought. Where was I going with this? Oh, I hate when um, that. This was about me. You talk about, they say men lead. Oh but- yeah. Men lead. Thank you. So here's the thing. Why is the number one search term for women? Why are men emotionally unavailable? Why are men commitment phobic? Why do men ghost? If men are so great at leaders of the relationship, why are they the ones that in the short term, they catch the prey, but they can't keep it long term? This is why I always say to women, you are in charge of your relationship destiny. It is not, don't give your power to the man because you're giving the job to the wrong person. In addition, Ladies, you are in charge of the emotional container of the relationship because we men are bad at it, okay? We were taught as young boys to stuff our emotions. We were taught to, that um, to be a man, you have to be practically violent to be a man, okay? Mm-hmm. That's what we were taught, okay? So we're not good at the emotional container of relationship. You are. So here's the bottom line. Dump your feelings on a guy. Dump them. Now, a lot of people will tell you to do the opposite, but let me tell you why. The guy who is actually into you, he's the guy who's going to, and when I say dump, I mean express your feelings on a regular and consistent basis, okay? Most women, but I'm afraid he's going to disappear, but I'm afraid he's going to bolt. I'm afraid. Yeah, you want him to do that. You want the guys who are not that into you to do that sooner rather than later. But the guy who likes you, genuinely likes you, and when you share and express your feelings, he's going to start leaning into the relationship. The only guys that lean back are the guys incapable anyway. But if you want that guy, knock yourself out. You'll spend five years racking your brain and then going, and every woman says this, I knew right in the beginning it was wrong but I went against my better judgment. If I had, the bodies are piled from here to the moon, and that's 250,000 miles away of women. That's how, and you could go back and forth a thousand times. That's how many women bought into this, but he might change because magic fairy dust is going to change everything. Okay, I'm done yelling. Okay. So, no, it's all good. I love it. I and like to, to be your, dramatic. Yeah, that's all right. To your point, Jonathan, I, as someone who's going to share a, a part of my experience. By the way, was I off base? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, no, you weren't. And, and to the point where for myself, what I noticed as I was dating, you know, because of my own wounds and my cultural upbringing, I was used to in, uh, pretzeling myself was a way to feel loved, right? Like I got to do this. I got, you know, I, I got to f- literally do all kinds of tricks in order to get love. Yeah. 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 And then what? Yeah. 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 You sound a little New Yorker there. Yeah. 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 I'm full blown Californian. Oh, I know. <laughs> <At the beach. laughs> and then I recognized that, uh, that that was uh, through my own work recognized, oh my gosh, this is, this is a wound I have. And, and to know that the right person, cause I'm now in. Is a it re- a wound or a pattern? Oh, bo- oh good point. It could be. Yeah, I just want to be clear. The wound yeah. causes you to have this pattern. So I just wanted to differentiate. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, do you want to speak to that before I continue? Well, whatever wound caused you to pretzel, most likely it's something between your father and you that happened in childhood or your mother or whatever. That's where the wound happened. But the pattern is this 
pretzeling, which is a very common thing because women even traditionally have been so conditioned that the men are the leaders of the relationship. It's, it's been passed down by society because we've been a patriarchal society, uh, not just, you know, not just because of financial reasons, but every, because men are bigger and stronger, right? And it's the man's way or the highway. Well, that fucking shit ain't acceptable anymore. It's a two way, it's a two lane street. And I'm speaking to guys as well when I say this. Guys, it's about being co-creative in the relationship. It's not a one-way street because when, it's, when you adopt, it's my way or the highway, which a lot of people do as they age. You know, you mentioned I'm a midlife dating coach. That's after baby making years and before retirement. 55-year-old guys, they're kind of set in their ways. Women are kind of too. But if you want to create something special, it has to be co-creative. So you're not doing what you're doing is pretzeling. Mm -hmm. it's choosing partners that say i want to do this mutually and i always say ladies if the penis is going to go inside the vagina then he's got to then you have every right to ask for a co-creative relationship beautiful beautiful <laughs> yes a hundred percent and so i i had noticed that with that pattern within me okay. and then being now with someone that just is complete showing up very conscious, uh, creating the space, like literally says what's going on. And how long have you been dating? Uh, we've been talking for a month and now three weeks of conversations every day. Okay. Talking. You're still in the baby stage, oh, babe, but it's good. It's, it's the best so far. So far. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mazel tov. <laughs> And we'll talk again in a year from now. How's that? <laughs> well, I always say, you know, oh my God, like it's ridiculous how many people will vomit their relationships on Facebook. Oh my God, I met the love of my life, blah, 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 blah. And they get married. And then two weeks later, I don't see any pictures of the person on that person's page anymore. Mm. I'm tongue in cheeking this, but, of course, of course. Um, you know, it, until you actually have established four seasons into a relationship, you know, the, the summer, which is the hot, you know, the, the, you know, the fall where you're settling in the winter because you're going to have a storm and then come back to the spring until you've experienced four seasons. Um, it's still the fledgling relationship. And believe me, the real shit starts to come out at the three month mark. That's when guys typically hit their emotional capacity. So from an emotional perspective, we kind of anticipate women are more emotional than we men. And so we kind of keep a buffer space. We sometimes, we'll, we'll come on strong in the beginning. We'll say all the right words because we're trying to get laid. And by the way, I don't mean this in any disingenuine way or disful, re, disrespectful way, but the reality is the biology of sex is a huge motivator in the early stage of the dating when you're meeting strangers. You know, it's a little bit different when you've known someone for a decade and you decide to couple together and that sort of thing. But we're driven by that biology. But we kind of expect you to want more than us. So what we do is we start to create, you know, we, we come on strong and then we start pulling away a little bit to create buffer because we don't want to make a promise we can't keep. So this is where it gets a little delicate. So guys pull away because they don't want to imply the future until they've solidly know that they want you in the future. And I believe that takes a good solid year to know that. Yes. Solid year. I'm not saying we can't know that in the first three months, but really solidify it because we also expect women to be batshit crazy too. And I'm saying this tongue in cheek, but on some level, here's what I think crazy is. Your emotional expectation is here, our emotional expectation is here. And that space in between is called drama because you want us to be here. And we're like, but I can only go up here. You got to come down, like what you said, come down to his level and understand it from our point of view because that space in between is going to be drama. Yes. Am I making sense? Oh yeah, you are. Okay. You're, you're making 100% sense. And, and I could say that uh, to your point, like because it's been pretty intense, there's already been a couple of times, even for me, where there's a discomfort. And now the, let's have a conversation about that. And this is the reality is, oh, go, I'm not even going to. No, I was going to say, so women have this 
tendency to think that they're more evolved than men. Okay. Now, from a from an emotional evolutionary perspective, it's not. No one's more evolved than the other gender. However, women study relationships to the tune of 10 times greater than men. Books like Attached, right here. Mm -hmm. Books like Getting the Love You Want, here. Books like How to Make Love All the Time, here. Nine, 999 women out of 1,000 people are the ones buying this. Men aren't buying these books. So they just happen to be a little bit more schooled in the mechanics of a relationship than men. So it fascinates me here. Women are the school teachers, they're dating children, and they expect the children to be adults. Guys don't know this shit. Very few men actually study relationships. I do because I do it for a living. So right off the bat, it's more about introducing them and being an invitation to learn these things than having an expectation that they know it. Women shoot themselves in the foot because they have expectations. Men shoot themselves in the foot because they're not only clueless, but they're also a bit selfish. Not all men. Right. A big percentage. Because human beings are oftentimes only in their bubble, men and women alike. So do you think there's a specific manner in which to approach? Say, say we are the leader of the emotion of, of the relationship and how we want it to look. What are, give us an example of perhaps how you would ask a woman to approach her partner uh, with saying something like she needs something different within the relationship. So let's start with the most important thing and that's sexual exclusivity. Okay. okay? So I'm going to start with that because that's the first thing. First layer of commitment is exclusivity and we'll call it sexual exclusivity. So here's what I tell my clients is you simply say, you know, in the dating process, you know, when I'm dating someone and we choose to be intimate, I just want to let you know that when I'm intimate with a man, I'm monogamous and I begin to be exclusive. And what I mean to say is I don't see other people when I'm being sexually, you know, having sexual activity with somebody and I'm monogamous. How do you operate? So by asking him how he operates, you're not telling him, hey, if you want to fuck me, you got to be exclusive. No, you're not saying that. You're making him, you're just telling him how you operate. Okay, how he responds is going to speak volumes. If he leans into it, he's a good candidate. If he acts a little wishy-washy, that's a clue. You have to be Columbo. You have to be a detective. So that's number one. Number two, you know, it's interesting, Patty. I coach women who call me up and they've been in a relationship for six months, eight months, a year, two years with a guy. And I'll get calls like this. Jonathan, I just want more commitment from my guy. I'm like, great, what does that look like for you? Well, Jonathan, I just want more commitment from him. I'm like, great, what does that look like for you? But Jonathan, I just want him to be more committed to me. I'm like, great, what does that look like for you? And I keep repeating it until they actually give me a demonstration. Because if you can't demonstrate to your coach what commitment is, how the fuck are you gonna be able to demonstrate it to him? So let me give you an example. So. In my dating life, I say, look, the kind of relationship I'm looking for is we spend three or four days and nights a week together doing shared activities, hobbies, mutual interests, spending time with family and friends, traveling together, teamwork based, you know, teamwork building skills. If you need me to support you by taking you to the airport, consider it done. I'm your teammate. I'm your, you know, I, I treat it like a team. And eventually I want to move in and get married. So I'm crystal clear. I say that. To me, I say that on the first, sometimes I say it on the first phone call, but the first or second date. I'm just expressing what I want. And then I say, how do you operate? So it's the same thing. Now, most guys, when you, when you give them, lay out the commitment, what commitment looks like for you, they're going to be deer in the headlights. Well, I just want to take things casual. I really don't know what I want. I just want to see. I want to just have fun. Your job is to say, all right, have a good life next. Because if you don't know what you want, I'm not here to, I'm not here to be your, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Your testing ground for that. And by the way, you know, guys will then actually, it, it actually forces them to actually look inward. So that's my invitation is to express what you're looking for and then see how they operate. Right. On that note though, 
I'm going to share something because <laughs> because you opened up a, a, a can of worms there for me in the okay. sense of when you talked about on your fir- like how you shared something on your first even on a first conversation. Couple of times. And I'm just saying that because some people will, and maybe you believe that we'll take that literally because there's part of it you, I've heard from other men that will say, you know, geez, on the first date she says, this is what I am, this is what I want. And I'm like, God, can I just say hello? Can I, can I meet you? Can I get to know oh, you? Oh, that's first? such a crock of shit by guys. You're just, this is a simple conversation. You don't, and by the way, my tone right now yeah. with you is very authoritative and very demonstrative, but it's done by tone. I could say, I could, okay, now I could have done it nicer way. <laughs> Go for you know, it. I'm looking for a guy who, you know, I'm looking for the kind of, so you say, what kind of relationship are you looking for? Oh, okay. I'm looking for one that we spend three or four days and nights a week together. I could have done it flowery. I'm doing it. I'm just demonstrating it, not how to do it, but what to do. I right. am tired of this. You know what? Dating is an interview process. Let's get fucking real. The interview is, are you going to be my boyfriend and girlfriend? It's by the way, the bodies are piled from here to the moon that everybody that had a great time on a first date, but they found out they were incompatible because they didn't ask really good questions. Stop making, and here's the thing, look at Nowadays, we're meeting people online. They're total strangers anyway. It's not about going out and having a great time at a cocktail party, you know, at some bar and going dancing afterwards. Yes, you can do those things, certainly, but people aren't gonna do that with strangers. Right now, they're doing coffee dates because the first date is the sniff test. You're sniffing each other like dogs do to see if you're actually attracted to one another. So it doesn't have to necessarily be on the first date. Actually, the first phone call, you can get a lot of content out of the way before you ever meet them. But look at, I know my advice goes against most dating coaches. I say interrogate people. Now I say it tongue in cheek, I say it, do it with kindness. What's my chapter? Do it with kindness, be sincere, all those things. But recognize that dating is a vetting process to choose a boyfriend, a girlfriend, and a boyfriend, a girlfriend is a vetting process to choose a partner. And we need, there needs to be some level of dispassion because chemistry can make us make such bad choices. Mm-hmm. I like the way uh, Marianne Williamson says in her um, public speaking, She'll say to her audience, you know, when you meet that guy or girl and the chemistry is off the charts and so intense and you two think you are soulmates and twin flames and everything, what's the first thing you should do when you get home? And the entire audience screams, pray. Because you got to pray because that is the most dangerous of all experiences, intense chemistry. And everybody wants intense chemistry. They're jonesing for it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, no, a hundred percent. So, so then. Come what, on, disagree with me on something. No, no. Well, I get, I was talking self-love. We almost disagreed. And then after you understood. <laughs> it, but let's, let's talk about uh, um, one is some, maybe some common mistakes that women, that women or men do when they are vetting. Is it that they just let the chemistry take over? And so they, they don't actually have a process that, of interviewing is, is what is the, how, why does well, it yeah, We're dealing with a couple of complexities. First off, you know, most people are meeting, meeting through a dating app. And the reality is, is most people put together shitty profiles. I mean, it is so fucking pathetic. The amount of effort people put into these little, you know, like here, just for fun. Let's, let's just look for fun. Just bear with me a second. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so like here's a first photograph. Now, I'm, I'm just, I'm not judging it, but I can barely tell who she is. Can you? No. Okay. Um, let's find another one. Uh, okay, Snapchat crap. Snapchat crap. I mean, I got, that is like the stupidity of people to put the snap. No disrespect on this person, but she's wearing sunglasses. She's far away. You can't see what she really looks like. Um, you know, I mean, the, I'm, I'm trying to find the most horrific examples, but my point is most people put mediocre pictures. So right off the bat, you're dealing with, here's what happens when you're not putting the best representation of yourself, and I don't mean glamour shots or anything like that, um, is 
we have doubt. So what happens when we're meeting people online is we have this doubt. Am I going to be attracted to them? So this doubt causes um, apprehension. It causes reservation. It causes kind of a, a lack of enthusiasm. Mm. So half the time people ghost one another back and forth, meaning not return texts, because they're, they're kind of interested, but they're kind of not. Right. That's the dilemma. So if people would start putting quality professional photographs or, or quality photographs and quality representations on themselves, they're going to have a better experience because then it creates enthusiasm. Oh, I want to meet this person. I want to talk to them right away. So and, yeah, go ahead. And the reason why you want professional is even if you're not the most attractive person, a photographer, a good photographer knows how to bring out your light. A good photographer knows how to bring out your heart. That's their job is to bring out the essence of who you are because that's what you want to capture. I see women's pictures that look like this, like it's literally that bad. Mm. Oh, by the way, men's pictures are no different. So, I mean, this is not right. singular to women. And, and this, this essence or radiance that you talk about, it is one of the three because you talked about the three things that men crave. Uh, in one oh, of what did, I can't remember what I said. What did I say? say radiance radiance is, one. Yeah. is one of them. You said sovereignty and variety. So sovereignty is that, you know why men love bitches? <laughs> men love bitches because bitch stands for babe in total control of herself. That's the acronym. Babe in total control of herself. Now she's in control of her sovereignty. She's in control of her life. She doesn't give her power away to a man. That's why a bitch is the most attractive. And please forgive that I'm saying it in the acronym sense, not in the uh, female dog sense or whatever the, the, the negative connotation. It's that, it's that level of sovereignty. That's the second piece. And variety just means mixing it up. You know, our human beings need a level of certainty. The six basic human needs. Go to Tony Robbins, type in six basic human needs. And the second most basic human need is variety, uncertainty, just a bit of, of spontaneity. And by the way, Everything that women crave or men crave, women crave the exact same thing. This is not singular, even though I, I talk to an audience of women. Um, so, well, what was it? Going back to radiance, what was the first thing I said to you before we started this recording? You always touch my hair. Yeah, because you have radiance in you. I just want to go oh, like that, you know, because you <laughs> radiate energy. Energy is seductive. And most women's profiles are like this. And guys are no different. They're just like this, you know, but. <laughs> right, right. No, 100%. I mean, I do get that, that uh, the radiance is, is, is basically your personal power and who you're about and, and to love that and, you know, and shout it from the rooftops to some degree, right? Like, like be full of yourself, if you will. So uh, let's go to intuition because you talk about that in your book also. Oh, and yeah. You know, I was thinking about something the other day. So in my book, I talk about intuition, but you know, it's interesting. I got a comment on my YouTube channel today from a woman who I rejected some years ago. <laughs> now, I, I don't want to share what I rejected her for because it, it's a little bit intimate and personal, but well, she happened to vomit it on, um, on YouTube, but I rejected her kind of for a, a ridiculous picky reason. I'm going to be honest with you. I was being a little picky. Okay. Um, oh, well, let me just own what it is. So she's a non-drinker and I like wine tasting. It's one of my favorite activities. So I thought to myself, I really don't want to meet someone who won't enjoy something I enjoy. I go with my best friend a couple times a year. I mean, right now we don't because of the pandemic, but it's one of my favorite activities is to go wine tasting. And this is a person who's a non-drinker. And I go, you know, I'm not sure I feel comfortable with that. And I chose not to ask her out. Well, she called me out on it. Well, it occurred to me, I'm being picky. I get it. But you know what? Maybe my intuition was speaking and I just chose another reason. I chose that as my reason for saying no. I often, I'm actually having an interesting perspective on the idea of being too picky. I think being too picky could be our intuition speaking, and we're just coming up with an egoic excuse for saying no to someone. 
It's just a perspective. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but learn to listen to your intuition. Start reading energy, start reading people because your intuition knows who you should lean into and who should not. Now, sometimes being picky is also your intuition saying you're not ready. That's the other piece. Our intuition can know that we're not ready for a certain person and we reject them maybe for some, I, some, for some ridiculous reason, but I think it's, there's a learning lesson there too. And I think it's our intuition speaking. It's just a perspective. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. No, uh, I, I, I 100% agree with that. And I think part of it, to your point, what I notice even in myself when I'm listening to what's going on inside of me, like I'll feel it very physically, a discomfort, a, a very physical slight, sometimes it's a little bit, sometimes it's stronger. Yeah. And so then I have to take the time to kind of look at what is all this about, you know, and, and I have to kind of do some introspection, write, talk to a friend to talk things out, what's going on inside of me, like just, or a coach, if you will, because there's a blind spot, there's something going on within me. And I know I need to do that because there's a, even truthfully, until you get, I think, versed in it to some degree, there's, there's this thing between trusting it and having still doubt. Is it really? Yeah. Good? And here's the doubt. You know what doubt always does? And I've gone on more. You just never know. You know what? You just never know. You just never know. You know, go on a date. You just never know. Give it a chance. Every single time I went again, I, I did the, you just never know. I've had a bad experience <laughs> every single time. My intuition did know whenever you have to say, whenever you have to convince yourself to go out with somebody, <laughs> that's your intuition saying, don't go out with them. Mm -hmm. If you have to convince yourself to go out with someone, that's, now this goes, this will actually, you know, every, almost every dating coach will do the opposite. Go against your gut. Go against your better judgment. Go against it because you just never know. You might be surprised. But I do believe our intuition is speaking all the time and it's giving us clues all the time. And when you learn how to listen, and you said it earlier, Patty, Patty our, our feelings are our barometer. In fact, I am going to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars. He says, Luke, feel your feelings. Feel the force. The force or source or universal energy is based on feelings. It doesn't come from the intellect. It comes from feelings. It, well, it comes really from the gut, right? So when you learn how to listen to those feelings, the visceral feelings, your, your, your barometer, your intuition is speaking all the time. All the time. I invite people to hone in and start listening and learning how to tap into their intuition. Yes. And, and I, as, sorry. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, I know that uh, I, when I feel that hit, I don't always know what's behind it. And so now I'm okay with the fact that I don't necessarily have the answer right away. And so I need time to kind of listen in a little bit more and find the words. And sometimes the words aren't perfect, but back to your other point, I'm, I keep hoping, <laughs> and that's usually, is that they'll feel my love and my, I'm, I'm, I'll even say, I'm not still 100% sure, but here's what I'm starting to notice that's yeah. going on within me. And I want to share this with you. And it's not perfect and it's not all figured out. Yeah. Uh, can you speak to that? Is that no, even- You know, it's you interesting. So the ego will rationalize every choice to make you feel good about every choice. So the ego will come up with all kinds of sinister, sneaky ways to justify a choice. How about you just, something didn't feel right. That's it. The minute you have to make meaning from it, you've created chaos in your life. And that's where a lot of disconnect happens. You know what? Something didn't feel right. I don't have to give it a reason. It just didn't feel right. That's it. And, if you and, have to keep searching for the why, you're going to drive yourself crazy because the ego has to rationalize everything. And what the ego does is it always points the finger at someone else. But it's, mine points it back at me to try to figure okay. it out. <laughs> so, well, but, but it's going to, but you, but. Well, yes, the ego will do that too. How about just accepting, hey, something felt off, next. Right. That's it. You don't even have to rationalize or justify it. 
Okay, because we're, we're, we're meaning-making machines, though. To yeah, something. you know, and I, I do A Course in Miracles every morning. I do a study group. And chapter, the first lesson in The Course in Miracles, 365 lesson is, everything has no meaning. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing it. Right. It's, we're, it's all, there, meaning is irrelevant. You know, this is a cup. That's what it is, a cup. Now, this cup means something to me because it says salty vibes. And my son, my son who passed away's nickname is Salty Vibes. So it has meaning to me, yes. But it's still just a cup, okay? So sometimes just accept it's just a cup. Mm. It's like um, in the Matrix, you know, the spoon. But that's a whole nother conversation. Right, right, right. No, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's good because I, uh, as I can overanalyze truthfully, uh, I, I can go into this. Well, it's the curly I, hair. That's what you think. <laughs> I think sometimes when you're in the personal development, when you're always trying to better oneself, I think I can get, I do, I'll get caught in that trap and trying to understand something else about myself, figure out the wound and yada, yada, yada. Ultimately though, it always boils down to this. So I contacted a therapist the other day because I wanted to resolve something and I just wanted perspective and she nailed it within the first one minute of conversation. But it always boils down to one action at the end of the day, always it boils down to this action over, well, two actions, well, one action, forgiveness. It mm -hmm. always boils down to forgiveness. Now, for those that aren't familiar, we oftentimes think of forgiveness as absolving somebody else for their actions. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness stands for, F-O-R, for giving love, for giving love. That's what forgiveness is, for giving love. So I started with forgiveness for myself. I then chose to forgive the, the, the person I had an interaction with. And then I forgive everyone else that's ever wronged me. And I continue to give myself love over and over and over and over and over again. It always boils down to forgiveness, which is really just a metaphor for forgiving love. Got it. Um, I have one more thing that I wanted to ask you about uh, because I thought this was very poignant and you referenced uh, Esther Perel, uh, someone that I also listened to and you talked about uh, relationships today being very much about a stable ambiguity. Yeah. I thought that was huge when you explained that. And I think it's important. I, I, when I heard it from you, I was like, oh my God, that's, that's the whole doubt thing. So can you talk about that? Because I thought that was quite big. What did I say? No, I know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I just riff from, I just channel from God and then I forget half of what I say. No, uh, stable ambiguity. So Esther Carell, I love her analogy. So the way I interpret this is most humans want companionship, connection, and sex. Most humans that want, you know, to interact with a person of, well, opposite sex or same sex or whatever. They're seeking companionship, connection, and sex, okay? Most humans will do the bare minimum to actually acquire those things, the bare minimum of effort. Mm -hmm. Now, it's kind of confusing for women because men come on so strong in the beginning. Like I had a client tell me, you know, the guy I'm dating in the beginning used to send me cute flirty text messages and always complimented me. And now we're two months in the relationship. He doesn't do this anymore. Yes. In the beginning, we are going to say whatever it takes to get laid. Okay. Once we settle into a relationship, we settle into who our true personality is. That's number one. But number two, most people do not have an awareness on the mechanics of a healthy, happy relationship. They don't understand the mechanics. So this is one of the reasons why in all my coaching clients read the book, Eight Dates by Dr. John Gottman. Eight Dates by Dr. John Gottman. This explains the eight most important fundamentals of a relationship. Now, since most people have no awareness of this, and men certainly don't have any awareness of this, most men, is that they're going to do the bare minimum because they don't know what it takes to, to create, to co-create a healthy, happy relationship. Hence why it's stable ambiguity because they're doing the bare minimum because they don't know what else they need to do. That's why I say, ladies, if that penis is going to go into a vagina, he's got to read this book with you. He's got to earn it. <laughs> Not earn it. It's not, because that's one-sided. It's a mutual okay. earning. By the way, everybody should buy my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway, on Amazon for 
Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Where's your copy? I don't see it. It's, it's a Kindle. Okay, it's a Kindle. It's a Kindle. Yeah. Um, so this is why there's such a rise of casual relationships. And this is for the midlife category, it's because they got, most people have gotten burned in their first marriage. Most people are harboring such negative resentment over their marriage that they really enter into the second phase of their life without a real game plan of what they want in relationship. When I was in my 20s, I had a blueprint. Grad, go to, after high school, go to college. After college, get a job. After getting a job, meet a girl, get married, buy a house, start a family. That was the blueprint. So here's the blueprint in midlife. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's literally, people are clueless. They don't know what it looks like. That's why reading these books all prepare you to be in a healthy, happy relationship. But since most people are myopic, they're not willing to invest. And ladies in particular, if a guy, I don't know how many women I've coached and I said, the two of you should do couples counseling. Oh, he would never do couples counseling. Why do you want to be with someone who's not going to invest in the mutual growth of a relationship? Let those guys be with the other women that will accept crumbs. Don't accept crumbs. Start to stand up for what you desire. Be that babe in total control of herself. And if he wants to have sex with you on a regular basis, then he's got to be willing to actually invest in growing the relationship. But you do it in a very loving, compassionate way. Not my, I'm just here to yell at you to wake you up. You're a teacher. I'm, by the way, be the Southern woman. Southern women know how to wrap men around their fingers because they use tonality and cuteness to get what they want. So start being like a Southern woman. Yes. That's just a, by the way, that's an absolute projection and judgment on my part. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. It's, it's really to, to make us understand that right now you're all fired up about it because that's your role, right? You're there to teach us and wake us up. And ultimately the tone is, is important and coming from a place of love and compassion because everybody's doing their best. It doesn't mean you don't ask for what you want. You don't, you don't direct things to, you know. You, you just ex simply express your requests. It's after, it's simply a request. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is making requests. The minute you tell somebody what to do, you're, you're screwed. But you make a request, then that's their choice. And if the choice is not to meet your request, then you have another choice. Should I stay or should I go? Right. On I'm that end on that note. <laughs> yes, we do. So thank you so much, Jonathan, for your time. This was beyond entertaining and also informative. So thank My you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, everybody look him up. I mean, you may want to share. I, I, Is anyone, I can't see if anyone's on live seeing this. They are. There's a bunch of people. Some people commented. Oh, why didn't you tell me some of the comments? Um, all right. So said, hi, Patty. Miriam said, you never know until you meet, but once you meet, you do know. That is your intuition. Oh, you can know before you meet. Really? That's, yeah, of course you do. We have a, our, our intuition speaks well before you meet. But now it's not real until it's real. That's true. Right. Right. Uh, yes. So that's... Um, what else? Someone else say anything. Someone say something. Ask him a question. Now's your chance. Those of you who are alive. Most of the people are liking. There's a few likes. Uh, Barry. Oh, come on, bashful people. Bashful people. Here's your chance. Give it to him. Um, yes, I guess they are a little bashful, but, um, all right. I'm looking on my phone to see who's on. Am I on? Oh, there I am. <laughs> there you There's are. Five comments. The reason allows, oh, That's I guess. The, oh, they're saying hello. Okay. Barry, Alan, Miriam, Shell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, a few people I'm sure will rewatch this, um, anyways after, but, okay. uh, that being said, uh, I, I don't want to mon over monopolize your time because uh, you know, yeah, already this was amazing and great. And, um, I, there is something that I could touch on, but well, next time, you know what? You might be somebody that, uh, I want to talk to on a regular basis. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I'm here for you, sweetheart. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to run. Yes. Big hugs to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You can reach him. He's everywhere. Thank you. Feeling it. Go to YouTube. Go to my podcast. Just type in Jonathan Asley. Big yes. gigantic Jonathan Bear hug. Yes. Mwah. Thank you all for tuning Thanks. in. Bye thank now. you for spending time with us. Ciao, everyone. Bye, everyone.